And today we are going to be uh, talking about interoperability in healthcare. And I think it's best if I just hand over to Robbie to introduce himself. If you could just give us a little bit of your background. Sure. Uh, Robbie, and then take it away. Thank you very much, Tim. So, yeah, my, as Tim said, my name is Robbie Carp. I'm the CEO of Fluffy Spider Technologies. Fluffy Spider is a digital health software development company. We specialize in digital health solutions and digital health um, interoperability, and you're going to get a flavor of what we do throughout the course of this presentation. So um, with that, I'm thank Tim, thanks very much for the opportunity, and I'm going to get on with it. Um, so I'm going to start by explaining what interoperability is. So in healthcare, interoperability is the integration of systems simplifying the communication and delivery of clinical information within a hospital and capturing and sharing of health information in any healthcare setting outside of a hospital, such as visiting your doctor at home, monitoring, that sort of thing. It includes telehealth, billing, appointments, pharmaceutical dispensing, and more. So it's the bringing together of every part of the healthcare journey. Interoperability is underpinned in some countries by government legislation, mandating the availability of patient information to the patient while protecting patient privacy on the governance side and interoperability on the technical side. I'm going to be talking about um, the interoperability aspect of healthcare technology today with a focus on devices and cloud EMR systems in the Australian healthcare landscape. Going through some examples where we have integrated systems and developed interoperable solutions and discussing where we need to focus our efforts to achieve interoperability in healthcare. So the concepts of always on, always connected, always available were the promises of the internet. And in many industries like banking and retail, this has been realized. You can log into your bank and make transactions 24 seven. You can buy pretty much anything, anytime you want online. But the healthcare industry has been a lot slower to adopt real-time connectivity and um, the availability of systems. There are privacy considerations that require technical solutions. And there has been a lack of commercial motivation by incumbent hardware and software vendors. However, we are reaching a point in healthcare where the technology through fast networks and interoperability standards can meet ethical best practices such as maintaining patient privacy. And at the same time, live connectivity of devices and systems is a reality. We want our healthcare systems to be interoperable so that health information is available to those parties that need it, have authority to access it when they need it. The reasons for, import, uh, the, reasons for the importance are to deliver more accurate, more personalized and more timely care to those who need it, improve the length and quality of life and thereby reduce the burden on the healthcare system overall. I'm going to start with an example of why, of, of how important um, healthcare interoperability is. So in the most recent New South Wales budget, there was $30.2 billion set aside um, for healthcare. Of that $32 billion, one initiative to unify New South Wales present EMR solutions, EMR is electronic medical record solutions, is getting $141 million to enhance care coordination, further digitization, improve patient experience, and increase service sustainability. This initiative is called the Single Digital Patient Record, this uh, project, which envisions a single holistic statewide view of every patient. And for that information to be readily accessible to anyone involved in the patient's care. So the SDPR project will consolidate the geographically fragmented health record systems in the state, including the patient administration system, the existing electronic medical record system, and the laboratory information management system into a unified platform. 
This single EMR platform will help clinicians get better informed, while patients will have a more seamless care experience. And to quote, um, the announcement said, it will give patients the confidence that regardless of where they live or which service they attend, their information will be available to their treating clinician in its entirety. So the summary of that is that this is a project to make New South Wales health systems interoperable. Robbie, can I just ask a question? Yes. We've been grappling with this topic for decades, haven't we? Uh, just how significant do you think is this latest effort, uh, you know, for the industry? Um, so given the funding that they're allocating to this, I think they've, um, first of all, understood that it's a very, very um, serious issue that needs to be addressed. Um, the seriousness, at least at the New South Wales level, is... Um, uh, significance. I think we need a concerted effort at the national level, and I will touch on that right at the end. Um, I mean, there, there are other projects going on. The Australian Digital Health Agency, which I'm going to mention as well, um, has, uh, you know, the, the My Health Record project going on. I, I think there's definitely an understanding that this is a topic that is critical um, it's a very difficult um, topic to solve. And I would say that, yeah, this is a okay. very, very good attempt. I'll just remind anyone in the audience, um, feel free to uh, type in any questions into the chat and I'll either read them out or invite you to go off um, mute and, and, and read it out yourself. Thanks, Robbie. All right. So these are the areas I'm going to be covering today. To build a truly resilient and interoperable organisation, interoperability needs to be a first-class concept, not an add-on. Hence, the following elements need to be addressed. Device and application integration, cloud connectivity, standards, protocols and APIs, data analytics and machine learning and AI, security, privacy and compliance. So I'm going to look at parts of all of these today. All right. So first off, um, a snapshot of where in Australia we are at the moment. A 2021 National Digital Health Strategy Survey by the Australian Digital Health Agency had around 7,500 responses. It asked questions about how to best support digital health from three groups, the general public, healthcare providers and industry partners. Most of the responses were from the general public, and most of the respondents lived in metropolitan areas. For the general public responses, uh, responses um, most of the general public wants to access their health information digitally. They currently use online booking and payment platforms, but would be keen to try out new digital health services. They cited receiving test results to be a service they're interested in. They claim that the barriers to digital health uptake are because one of the parties the healthcare, the healthcare provider or themselves don't have the right technology available. Um, the second party, the healthcare providers, are keen to support digital health services. They already do it in a variety of ways. They mention patient self-management and integration of services and systems as key areas of importance they would like to see happen over the next five years. Their main day-to-day -day barrier to uptake is because of lack of interoperability. And the industry partners are almost unanimously supportive of digital healthcare. As mostly commercial partners, they see the benefit in efficiencies that can be gained from connectivity, interoperability, and the automation of services. So the summary of this particular survey is that even though it was a very small um, set of respondents, 7,500, people and it, it was a very narrow focus specifically on digital health. Nevertheless, it offers an insight into the current state of where Australian digital health is at. As a nation, we, like other nations, have had to embrace new models of care over the last two years. And we've been fortunate that we have stability at the very base levels of infrastructure, 
Both wide and mobile internet exists to much of populated Australia. We have an awareness of networks and online services within the population. Furthermore, there is a consensus that what is needed now are systems that can communicate, service one another by exchanging information by using secure and holistic standardised patterns. In other words, interoperability. So the first element of, that is needed for interoperability is um, cloud connectivity. The need for cloud connectivity when talking about interoperability should really be self-evident. You can't have interoperability interoperable systems um, if they don't connect. The benefits of cloud connectivity for healthcare are greater than those just needed for interoperability. The cloud offers scalability, both up and down, built-in failover, backup accessibility, speed of bringing up new services, and usually a base level of security. It removes the large upfront investments into technology infrastructure. Cloud computing should be thought of and is a readily available commodity. It comes with challenges of changing operating models, shortage of knowledge in organisations, security considerations that run beyond, beyond the base level security offered by the cloud provider, and hence often a struggle to sell the case for the cloud within established organisations like healthcare. Cloud, enable, cloud enablement isn't a simple lift and shift operation. It isn't a case of placing application software into a VM in the cloud with bridging APIs for a web server. And while organi organizations do that, this kind of approach opens um, the path to trouble in the future. The technical liability is significant and cloud enablement really requires a cloud native application. Just got a question uh, in the chat. Uh, are yep. you going to be covering APIs later on the presentation? There will be some, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, interoperability standards and, and within that I will be talking about APIs, but not, not in tremendous detail, but yeah. There was a question from Alec Welsh uh, just saying how much of this relates to IP development, sorry, API development? Is this the core answer to connectivity and does this have to come from each of the digital health developers? So I'm not seeing that in the chat, by the way. Um, can you say that again, please? Tim? Okay. Um, I'll just continue on then. All right. Um, so just with cloud connectivity um, and security. So I, I had an old boss that used to say that the only way to keep a computer secure was to switch it off, unplug it, put it in a cupboard and lock the cupboard. So we all understand that there are security risks to do with cloud connectivity, but um, they can be mitigated. Recently, the Australian Federal Government's Digital Transformation Agency released its Secure Cloud Strategy update in October 2021. The strategy outlines seven key principles for um, cloud security or cloud enablement. The first one is make risk-based decisions when applying cloud security, design services for the cloud, use public cloud services by default, use as much of the cloud as possible, avoid customizations and you use cloud services as they come, take full advantage of cloud automation practices and monitor the health and usage of cloud services in real time. Um, I thought a good way to illustrate um, cloud connectivity effectively would be through a case study. Um, we work closely with VisionFlex, an early innovator and pioneer in the Australian medtech scene. The particular project that I want to use as today's example was based around developing a product that integrated with many specialist peripherals and data acquisition devices like medical cameras, digital stethoscopes, SPO2 monitors, and more. The goal was to get all of these into a single portable telehealth platform called the ProEX. 
So the Pro-EX is a store and forward device with an onboard medical record system that connects to other medical record systems via an HL7 interface and to multiple telehealth systems. The store and forward part is important because when working in remote situations, there may be no network. Today, the ProEx supports over 30 specialist devices and cameras and connects to numerous medical record systems. It represents a class of product that didn't exist in such a form before, offering integration of devices and interoperability between systems. We interviewed one of VisionFlex's early customers, Dr. Meg McGowan, to, to put together a detailed case study around our work of VisionFlex on the ProEx product. And that's a picture of Dr. Meg McGowan over there. And that's actually a picture of the ProEx product next to her. Dr. McCowan was working with the Australian Antarctic Division at the time and had just launched the Centre for Antarctic Research and Maritime Medicine from Davis Station in Antarctica. One of the highlights of Dr. McGowan's story is her live stream of a dental procedure on a mannequin from Antarctica to Canberra, demonstrating the capability and effectiveness of a connected, interoperable system together with telehealth. This ended up being the centrepiece for the Australian government launching the Centre for Antarctic Research and Maritime Medicine. Today, wireless devices and telehealth systems are the norm, but it takes end-to-end -end interoperability to make the services and the data collection useful. And if you're interested, this case study is available on our website. Um, are there any more questions around that? No, I'll just um, check. I'm, I'm just interested at the moment in, I mean, this, uh, you, this, I'm just wondering this about cloud because we have um, this concept of edge computing and, and with cloud comes latency, uh, which can, can be an imp, imp, uh, consideration in in some medical device applications so I, i'm expecting later on you'll be talking about things that aren't necessarily connected to the cloud or uh or connected in some other way or right. is it so, through the cloud um the expectation is that the services themselves are cloud enabled the there may be intermediaries like the pro x which is a store and forward so it doesn't need live connectivity if it's not available um the devices which i will get to very soon um there there is also there's different models of working some of them need to be uh cloud connected but usually there is an intermediary of cloud connectivity um okay that's fine yeah we'll, we'll keep moving all right there there's a question about blockchain i'm actually not going to blockchain um in this talk at all it does have a place but it uh i'm not knowledgeable enough about it at the moment and it's not really for this uh topic yeah all right so um the next topic in um interoperability the next element is device and application integration to get true interoperability you need to integrate everything that can be recorded and you want to automate all of that and ideally you want the data to be structured that's actually very important so this bed plus all of the additional sensing equipment can gather information about the patient's weight body temperature heartbeat blood oxygen and it includes pressure sensors the bed will electronic electronically update a patient's medical record with the data including how many times the patient has left their bed, how often they've been turned in the bed. I'm going to now look at uh, four specific examples um, that we've worked on um, and, and talk about the interoperability aspects of those. The first one is Bluetooth beacons and Bluetooth appliances. The second one is specialist medical devices, such as cameras and ultrasound devices. The third one is telehealth systems, and the fourth one is medical record systems. Okay, let's start with Bluetooth device integration. So I've picked all four of these because they 
they address one particular slice of the interoperability overall solution that offers particular challenges. In Bluetooth device integration, there's, there's let's just say, two different types of categories of Bluetooth devices. There's what's called a Bluetooth low energy beacon, and there's what's called a Bluetooth appliance, okay? A Bluetooth low energy beacon is something like, say, a patch on the skin. It um, sits on the skin and it passively broadcasts um, unstructured data, such as the skin temperature, onto the Bluetooth network. A paired device, uh, a, a Bluetooth appliance is something like a paired device with uh, some sort of a request response protocol. For example, um, an on-wrong blood pressure monitor. For the Bluetooth beacon, it uses the Bluetooth broadcast network to transfer the data. Usually there is no standards-based approach. The protocol needs to be defined with or obtained from the developer, the manufacturer, or in some cases even reverse engineered. The security model is often weak. And I'll be talking about um, the security aspects of um, this in particular in a security bit. For paired devices, um, hopefully it's a registered Bluetooth device with a UUID. They're not all like that. Um, hopefully it follows a standard Bluetooth profile. So the Omron blood pressure monitor follows the, blood, the Bluetooth blood pressure monitor profile. So we know how to talk to it. It's interoperable. The data comes across in a way that we understand. But in both of these cases, if the standards aren't followed, then we, we need to work with the manufacturer perhaps, or as I said, maybe we just need to figure it out ourselves. The next um, category are medical cameras and other devices. Um, specialist cameras are, um, they, they, um, they offer a particular type of, uh, you know, um, all right, the, 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 these are two good examples of devices that they're very useful, the specialist cameras and the, the ultrasound devices, but they can be difficult to integrate for technical reasons. Um, so the benefits of having a specialist camera, is, such as an otoscope, would be it would be useful if it was able to be associated with a patient record. Um, what is an otoscope? Oh, it looks inside your ear. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, often we will we will get a camera, and it's it's just a camera by itself. If there's there's no nothing that else goes with it. And um, so I'll, I'll I'll tell you a quick story about um, a particular skin specialist I know. Um, the skin specialist takes photos of your skin with his iPhone. And what he does is he plugs the iPhone into the computer at the end of the session and then imports it into the record, the medical record. But there's a lot of risk in, you know, there's no defined process there. There's a lot of risk in there. It could be an integrity error. If for example, uh, he becomes distracted, it goes into the wrong patient. Um, maybe the screen changes, that kind of thing. So, what we would be looking for is a camera that has integration directly to a medical record. Um, cameras as well offer specific challenges. They normally connect by USB, and that means that they require a host computer, and they require a matching host uh, software application and often specialist drivers to be working properly. Um, if they support universal video class, then normally they can be supported by the operating system, but not always. Um, operating systems themselves um, introduce all sorts of potential um, uh, connectivity interoperability issues. If the operating system is too old, the drivers may not be supported, that kind of thing. Um, and the other one was the ultrasound machine. So with integrated ultrasound machines, um, there's only two ways to integrate, integrate ultrasound machines that I'm aware of. Number one is you get a video feed. So you're not doing much besides treating it as a camera really. 
So it comes across over uh, USB or sometimes HDMI if you have HDMI input. The other way is that the ultrasound machine manufacturer gives you an SDK. You get the data points from the ultrasound machine and you need to construct a 3D image uh, at your um, on the computer side. So again, it needs an SDK, it needs a host application, it needs a host computer. And we've been in a situation before where the drivers weren't available for the particular operating system we, we had um, and, and, you know, that sort of thing. The SDK wasn't available. So th there are challenges in integrating um, these kinds of devices. And I've picked these two because they're two very, very um, extreme kinds of devices that require the support of, of an environment. They're tricky to integrate. Okay, the, the next one is telehealth systems. And I, I think we can all recognize that telehealth is really um, a first class component of an overall solution today. Um, my, my GP is about, he's somewhere between 87 and 92 years old. I don't exactly know. His idea of telehealth is he'll call me on his phone. Um, and so and that's what he's been doing during lockdown. Um, but really, obviously, that doesn't integrate to anything at all. He takes some notes, but it, it's, it's not a good solution. We want our telehealth um, to be integrated properly. So um, for, for telehealth to really be interoperable, it has to be part of all the other systems, such as patient management. You know, are we on a call today or is the patient coming into the surgery? And diagnosis. If they're in the surgery, then can we permanently capture the data from the camera, the blood pressure monitor, or are they at home? If they're at home, do they have some sort of a camera that they can work with to, you know, um, show the doctor? Um, the important part here is that seamless interoperability of telehealth will make use of specialist, will make the use of specialist medical equipment easy. By not having um, the telehealth service fully integrated and interoperable, the specialist camera won't be used and the diagnosis may be compromised. Um, cameras in particular, again, um, have all sorts of issues with telehealth. Lighting, lenses, angles, these are, these are all things that will affect the diagnosis. And while there are inroads into solving some of those um, challenges with the AI, the ones I've seen require specialist equipment and they're really not foolproof. So there's a way to go. The challenge with integrating telehealth systems is that there really are a lot of them, many of them legacy or proprietary, meaning they can't be integrated. The ones that can be integrated either provide an SDK, and we talked about SDKs just with the ultrasound, same story, you need a host. Um, for and those, For those who don't know, can you just remind us what an SDK is? Oh, sorry, software development kit. Yeah. So um, that's the thing that programmers will get to, sorry, I'm, I'm assuming a highly technical audience, apologies. So the, the manufacturer of the medical device might give what's called a driver i think so it's it's kind of like that at a higher level it, it offers a way to talk to the camera or the telehealth system in a organized way and control it get data from it that kind of thing um so so the ones that can be integrated um use standards there is a telehealth um standard uh, for, for the actual audio video called WebRTC. And the thing about that is it's a web-based standard and it means you can use um, an embeddable browser-based solution like Electron to create your integration. And that's the easiest way to do it. To do it. The other way is if instead of trying to integrate the telehealth system into your system, you work within the telehealth providers ecosystem. And I've got three examples of that here. One of them is Coview. Coview is an Australian company that um, 
have developed a telehealth system um, and they have the concept of apps in their ecosystem. Currently, there's 12 apps um, on their website under the GP and specialist tools category. Um, they have a consumer facing subscription model and each app costs um, an additional monthly fee. VisionFlex, which is the company we work with, um, they are a hardware and software company. Um, the VisionFlex um, telehealth product is aimed at businesses and enterprise. There are different tiers that include um, access to their hardware products. Um, their specialist equipment works with their telehealth service using their ProEx product. The telehealth sessions can be recorded and incorporated into, incorporated into the patient record. So it's available then to be integrated into other medical record systems, making it interoperable. The third example is a company called Taito Care. They're an Israeli company. They also have specialist hardware. They're consumer facing. Um, and like VisionFlex, they also make their telehealth service results available um, to other uh, medical record systems. Um, there's a question on the chat. Let me just see. So yeah, did you want to address that now or did you want yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I can, like, I can. The, yeah. So, you know, clock, clocks are an issue. Um, there's no question about it. Um, we, okay. So the way, the way we've dealt with it is we have an expectation of a time server. So an NTP server somewhere and the, um, so, so we're looking at it, we're normally looking at interoperability and again, interoperability assumes there's a network behind it, an internet behind it. And if there's an internet behind it, we can assume that there's an NDP server somewhere we can connect to. Um, and so we expect that the clocks are synchronized, but you know, often there's a drift of, of, of small amounts and, and you allow for a certain tolerance in there. Um, that yeah i think that really answers that question i hope uh all right okay this is the the biggest one in the interoperability story medical record systems um we have integrated to certain medical record systems um but rather than talk about that i want to talk about medical record systems in a holistic way really so medical record systems are the most important system in a non-interoperable solution. Um, the medical record system, EMR, is the repository of all the patient identifying information and is used to store personal medical data. EMR systems have traditionally, or well, still are proprietary. The largest EMR vendor in the world is a company called Epic Systems in the USA. There was a May 2021 article in Forbes with the founder of Epic Systems. And this is the quote from the article. Epic Systems founder, Judy Faulkner, built an empire pioneering and later dominating electronic medical records. For decades, she's kept them walled off from competitors. I'm mentioning this because it adds the flavor for the challenges for medical record systems. That article, while it's centered on Epic Systems, it does talk a lot about interoperability. Another relevant quote from that same article um, from one of the executives at Epic says, sharing medical records with third parties, even at the patient's own request, could pose serious risks to patient privacy. So these are the sorts of challenges um, posed to interoperability. There needs to be a compelling business case for interoperability, and there needs to be a business case for the large incumbents because there's nothing in it for them otherwise. EPIC is required to follow US federal guidelines mandating standards based interoperability. Like others, EPIC has adopted the FHIR standard, which I'm coming to next, to share um, health records because they have to. However, we will see there are ways that um, they are still trying to protect their patient data. 
Okay, so the next part of interoperability is the standards part, um, standards protocols and APIs. The standard that is being adopted globally is called FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperable, Interoperability Resources. Trying to say interoperability and interoperable many times. Sorry, I'm tripping over myself. Um, it's a standard for healthcare interoperability built on an existing standard called HL7, Healthcare Level 7, for exchanging information in healthcare. Often, FIRE is termed HL7 FIRE, and it's um, the standard is maintained at, um, at the site hl7.org, which is a not-for-profit um, international standards organization. The intention was to create a specification for sharing health data and creating health workflows that used modern web technologies, meaning the specification could easily be incorporated into online and interconnected devices, uh, services. So interoperability, okay. Interoperability is built in by design. To quote the original author, I built a specification that can actually be used for doing lab reports. FIRE was conceived in 2011. The first working draft was published in 2014. Uh, yeah, 2014. The most recent um, release, which is R4, was published in 2019, and that's the one being used everywhere. Um, there is a release five that is soliciting feedback now. Um, okay, so FIRE is based on the concept of resources, which I'll explain in, in a sec. Um, FIRE release number four supports 151 resources. That's the full specification. And it has the ability for extensions, which I will also go into in a sec. Um, there are built-in resources for patient data, conditions, security, content subscriptions, and more. FIRE encompasses the entirety of the healthcare workflow. The different areas are managed by la a large number of working groups covering the spectrum of the healthcare space. And so this slide is showing you what some of the working groups are. There's more than this. They, they're covering everything. Who's using FIRE? Um, many governments around the world are using FIRE and pretty much anyone who is doing anything in healthcare in the technology space is using FIRE um, as its underlying um, uh, platform. The one that you might be most familiar with is um, Apple Health, which um, uses uh, uh, what's called Apple Health Kit, which uses Fire underneath. Okay, the technical aspects of the standard in a nutshell. It provides a consistent, easy to implement and rigorous mechanism for exchanging data between healthcare applications. The goal is to build a base set of resources that satisfy the majority of common use cases. FIRE resources as the standard data type that is exchanged, is the standard data type that is exchanged. The quote from the FIRE, um, from the FIRE website is, think of resources as paper forms reflecting different types of clinical and administrative information that can be captured and shared. So the FIRE specification defines a standard form, generic template, and you can add to it if you want to. The resources themselves are represented as either JSON, which is a JavaScript object notation, or XML documents. They can, the important part is they can easily be shared, parsed by standard tools and the human readable. The APIs themselves use REST over HTTP, and that's a common web technology for interaction. What's important here is that no new underlying protocols are needed, no new programming languages are needed. It's completely programming language agnostic, and it's easily embedded into existing frameworks and systems. 
There's an extension framework for extending fire resources as needed. Um, the extensions have the potential to allow proprietary data, but it isn't viewed well by the fire community. Um, there are specific statements about that that I'll get to in a sec. Um, there is a bulk data import export for large data sets, which is suitable for migrating existing systems to new fire-based systems. Resources um, are defined as follows. They need to be addressable by URL. So again, we have the concept of they must be, um, uh, they, you know, where there's an expectation of it to be um, network internet connected. Um, and it needs, there needs to be a human readable part. There needs to be metadata for searches. Um, and there needs to be the, the, the rest of it is structured data. And there is an extensibility framework. Um, how wide is fire adoption versus, versus HL7? So HL7 at the moment is um, probably more widely used on kind of internal networks and that sort of thing. Once you start talking about um, the internet and interoperable healthcare services, it's all fire. Um, this is an example of a fire patient resource in JSON. So there, there's a lot of sections here um, and I'm conscious of the time, so I'm not going to go into each and every one of them. And by the way, if anyone wants to know anything afterwards, please get in touch with me. Um, DICOM is a standard that FIRE can make use of. In this particular example, this is the human readable section of the patient resource. So it's designed to be embeddable into someone else's application um, and, and easily viewed. This is the same patient resource in XML. Um, in this patient resource, we have a patient called Duck Donald. Um, I put it there because what it does is show how you can include a photograph into this particular resource. Um, and it also links to another, um, another fire resource. The photo is base64 in, encoded, like in your emails. So these, these can end up being quite large. And this particular fire resource example is for a chest um, CT scan. Um, the modality refers to um, a DICOM um, computer tomography or CT scan um, and the body site, which is on the right hand side, um, the display is the upper trunk structure, which means chest. And this is again, the human readable part of it. Um, going to the chat, how do you go about integrating using FHIR while maintaining i 6304 compliance software as a medical device? So the compliance section, let me get to that. I do mention some compliance at the end, not 6304 specifically, but um, there, there's no conflict there. Um, all right. Let me talk briefly about the extension framework. So extensibility is a fundamental part of the design of the fire specification. Every single element um, in a resource can have extension child elements to represent additional information that's not part of the basic definition of the resource. To quote the relevant, um, to, to quote the fire website, Note that unlike in many other specifications, there can be no stigma associated with use of extensions by any application, project or standard. The use of extensions is what allows the FHIR specification to retain a core simplicity for everyone. To make the use of extensions safe and manageable, there is a strict governance applied to the definition and use of extensions. Although any implementer can define and use extensions, there is a set of requirements that must be met as part of the use and definition. A URL is mandatory and the value types um, need to be from a defined set. 
So the, the theory is that for an extension to be incorporated, there needs to be um, a definition of the extension that's accessible by URL. But despite that, we've heard from other integrators and other implementers that there are ways around that to still maintain um, certain proprietary information. So there, there's a bit of a way to go with it. Okay, getting started with Fire. So there's a Fire server, and then there's some sort of interaction interaction um, with Fire. We'll start with the Fire server. There's un unless you're doing something really special you don't need to implement a fire server it's a lot of work um, and there are plenty to choose from um, all of the big hosting companies have them and there's even a good open source one called firely which is really quite good and very well supported by way of example this is a system architecture diagram for the aws fireworks product it's out of the box it does everything you will need. Um, it supports um, all the base uh, revision for fire resources um, and, and it allows for all of the API interaction. The point is there's no need to be creating a fire server from scratch unless you have something unique to offer. The other side is the fire client. And when there was a question earlier about APIs, effectively, this is the API. You access a fire server the same way you would access any other web service um, using REST um, interactions. Here is, a, is an example of a GET. Uh, it, it's retrieving a weight observation from a particular patient. Okay, and the URL defines what it is that it is you want to get. And the response is a payload like this. So that's that's the way that you interact with Fire. You don't need to, there's, there's no uh, new technologies that need to be incorporated. There's no new programming languages that need to be um, learned. It's designed to be integrated from the ground up. Okay, that, moving on now to the next part, um, data analytics data analytics, AI and ML. So although it's not strictly necessary um, for the enablement of interoperability, the vast pool of data becoming available from interoperable systems is definitely a beneficiary of interoperability. These data sets, which if, if obtained through a structured standard like FHIR, offer the potential to more deeply understand health conditions and the factors leading to them. At an organizational level, if your systems are interoperable, you will be able to analyze the data obtained, find patterns in, in the data, and this will help you optimize your healthcare services. At a macro level, by collecting massive amounts of data and analyzing that data, we get closer to the holy grail of predictive, preemptive healthcare. All right, so on to the security, privacy and compliance part of it, which is the last part of um, the elements of interoperability. So by definition, because they're connected, because they're online, interoperable systems offer more opportunities for, comp for compromise. Each component of the system is, has, is a potential weak spot but there are standard ways to protect most parts of the system. The most important thing is to identify what it is that needs to be protected. So I'll come back to that Bluetooth um, low energy remote patient monitoring system that I was talking about earlier. In this particular project, um, we've developed software that reads data from skin mounted sensors via a mobile phone, um, and a Bluetooth gateway hub. And it sends the data to a cloud service. So every step of the journey of the data is a poten potential attack service, service. Data from the Bluetooth flow energy beacons broadcast on the network, and they can be intercepted by anyone. Bad data can be injected into the network. 
the Bluetooth network can be jammed. The sensor hardware and the firmware itself could become compromised. The mobile app needs to be secure. The mobile phone operating system itself needs to be secure. That might rule out certain makes and models. The Bluetooth gateway hub, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi router, ISP, cloud service, these are all areas of risks. However, in this particular example, we're passively monitoring certain values from residents in an aged care facility. The residents are either not at risk or at very low risk for the conditions for which the sensor is is monitoring. So if the Bluetooth sensor is sending a data point only that can be associated with the MAC address of the sensor, does it matter? Maybe not because there's no identifying information about the resident. If fake data is injected into the system, does it matter? Probably yes, because it can make it look like the resident is out of range for the reading, which may trigger some sort of an alert. If the Bluetooth network is jammed for a short while, does it matter? Maybe not, because the residents are either not at risk or at low risk. It would be the same as if the internet or the cellular network itself had a brief outage. But if any of those networks were unavailable for more than a short time, it may be problematic. We need to define what is a short time and what's an acceptable short time. However, if personal information is available with the reading, then the tolerance for risk becomes severely reduced and may contravene regulatory compliance rules. And so it goes for every step. You need to work out what it is you're protecting and then you work out how you best protect that. So there's a question here from Pierre. Is there a risk that national government issued security standards and guidelines provide a sol- false sense of being state of the art when in fact we're always late and behind the... Um, I would say that they are a bare minimum. Um, I think that reasonably should try to go above and beyond those. So kind of yes, but um, they're they're not as far behind as uh, I think you think. Um, It really, it it honestly depends on the uh, case. What what I heard, Robbie, when you were going through this example is essentially a risk analysis yeah. process which you know you apply to every aspect of of your your product development yeah no the security the, all of this is this is not specific to interoperability at all of course and and you know to any any part of it it is a risk analysis exactly you you're trying to decide based on what the use case is what it is you're going to do to protect that absolutely um there, but there are guidelines and there are um, there there are rules. So the Australian Cybersecurity Centre guidelines there there are guidelines, especially for software development of internet facing services and for databases. And these are a good starting point. And the other the other one, um, just as a good practice for um, internet facing services and it was the cloud enablement one the seven principles that i mentioned at the beginning basically just use standard stuff every time you you know every line of code as we like to say is the potential to introduce a new bug so don't have special customized software don't have special configuration if you really don't need it it's one more thing to check and it's one more area for potential weakness um i think this is my yeah okay so this is my last one on the security um there are regulations in the us we have hipaa in the eu we have gdpr um, and in australia we have the privacy act so hipaa in the us mandates national standards to protect sensitive patient health information from being disclosed without the patient's knowledge or consent the US Department of Health and Human Services issued the HIPAA privacy rule to implement this mandate. In Australia, we have the Privacy Act of 1988. In healthcare, the Privacy Act not only covers a patient's 
health issues as well as it also covers their private information that is any sort of data that could potentially identify an individual so this includes but is not limited to contact information medic, uh, medical examination results prescriptions uh, minutes from uh, patient doctor conversations medicare numbers admission discharge data that sort of thing in practice um, and, and this ties into the question about um, uh, compliance. In practice, um, so we, we've developed um, HIPAA compliance systems before. Um, in practice, what happens is we um, have to meet certain technical objectives for uh, privacy and security, such as encryption of data in transit and encryption of data at rest. Um, we have to use approved encryption algorithms and, and methodologies for that. And we prove that by our audit and documentation steps. Um, all right. So I'm going to move on to my last slide now. Um, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, how do we really achieve interoperability? Okay. The federal government and state governments really need to come up with a holistic set of regulations at a national level. The states really should not be working in silos. It's like different train gauges. Investments in country-wide digital health infrastructure need to be made. Entrenched industry partners should come together and adopt common data sharing standards. New business models that are not dependent on patient data ownership should be created. New health, new digital healthcare startups should create solutions based on these common standards. Um, they should be able to create disruption there. Um, and they need to be able to do that across all of the consumer touch points, mobile, desktop, browser, etc. And device manufacturers should be incentivized to adhere to common connectivity standards, USB, UVC, Bluetooth 5, etc. Um, and then finally, investments need to be made to train clinicians, nurses, etc. in digital technologies, especially those critical to achieve interoperability. Okay, so that is the end of the, the presentation part. Um, there haven't been a lot of questions. Um, and I, no. I, you know. No, unfortunately, the, uh, we did have quite a lot of material and I, I didn't try to interject or invite too many questions. So I, I knew that we wouldn't get through it, unfortunately. Um, but look, uh, we'd appreciate, is there anyone out there who has any particular questions? Uh, um, in... Yes. Okay. Here, Rosa. Um, hi. 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 Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And I hope uh, we could be able to have access to these uh, slides because I took notes, but they sometimes they pass too quickly. Yeah, um, no, of course. And also, then, how can I um, know how we start this? How, how can I say, look, the company where I work is implementing an application to um, for clinicians in mental health. Okay. Uh, to perform their interventions in psychology and psychiatry with different type of patients in New South Wales. Yep. Now, how, if we are, uh, how can I say, we are collecting a lot of information private information from the uh, clients, clients are the patients, and also, you know, supplying all the data through AI, AI and machine learning uh -huh. to the clinicians uh, to improve the, the whole system and implementation of care plans and safety plans. Now, how can we uh, integrate with this project? How can we put our product to be part of this device and application integration then? How can we start this? All right. So let's, let me go back to a much earlier slide. Um, one sec, let me do Because this. obviously we are doing this first for the 
private, uh, how can I say, system. Yep. Users is knowing the public system or you, to be used at the moment. We would like to uh, supply this service in the public uh, medical rooms. Um, okay, so if you, so if you can have a fire-based um, system behind all of this, Mm -hmm. Fire has a way of, um, they actually have a, a I don't know if it listed, I, I went to this page because I thought it might be here, but I can't see if it is. It, it has a way of, one of the resources is to do with um, forms and collection of information for this kind of thing. Um, so the way to do it would be to use the standard to create the forms okay. the forms will have you know the the input and output parts yep. and then that will then be able to be captured by the medical record system and then become part of the medical record itself so i can send you some separate information for this if, about this if you like um okay yes thanks so i think we've I got your email We've got your email on the last slide, I believe. Mine, yes, uh, do we? And I think also the, um, I think a core message is here is get involved in one of these working groups. That's, you know, the best way to uh, drive yeah. the application of, of these standards. It, it is. And, and by the way, Australia is, is extremely, extremely active in the FIRE um, working group scene. So that I think that, there's plenty of opportunity. Um, I was going to ask you, Tim, is, are these slides going to be available through your website somehow? No, no, usually I don't distribute them. It's up to people to contact you directly. So if you All do right. want a set of slides, just uh, go to the Fluffy Spider website and I guess you'll have a contact form there. Yeah.